In the first video of this series, I introduced you to the things that I found at Ken Ham's Ark Encounter. The impressive structure, loads of paintings and sculptures, and Hamanism, a new version of Christianity put together by Ken Ham that mixes dinosaurs and a type of hyper-evolution with stories from the Bible. As a science educator, I found that several of Ken Ham's exhibits about science were factually misleading. One in particular was his presentation on a genus of animals known from the fossil record called Archaeopteryx. Back in 2016, I had the privilege of visiting England where I got to see for myself the London specimen, one of 12 Archaeopteryx skeletons that were found in the limestone fossil beds of Germany and now reside in different museums and collections around the world. Today, dear viewer, I will introduce you to Archaeopteryx, and in the following episode, we'll compare what's actually been discovered about Archaeopteryx to the claims being made by Ken Ham at the Ark Encounter. So cozy on up and get ready. You're about to meet Archaeopteryx. Part bird, part dinosaur. The fossils that helped forever change our view of the history of life on planet Earth. Hello, John Perry here. Welcome to episode two on Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is a genus, a group of closely related species that lived in the Jurassic period, and they lived in what is now Germany. They are often described as reptile-like birds, or sometimes described as bird-like reptiles, because they are a transitional genus. They show a mixture of reptilian traits and bird-like traits. The very first skeleton of Archaeopteryx was first discovered by the scientific community in 1861. So this was just two years after Darwin had published his book on the origin of species. Scientists were kind of unsure of it at the start. They were debating it still. It was all very fresh. And then Archaeopteryx was discovered. And this fossil absolutely amazed the scientific community for several different reasons. First of all, it was extremely, extremely well preserved. This here is the London specimen. I actually took this picture myself, which is why it's not very high quality. <laughs> took it on my cell phone. This is the first skeleton of Archaeopteryx that was ever discovered. We call it the London specimen because it is now housed at the London Natural History Museum. As you can see in this specimen, not only is the skeleton extremely well preserved, but you can actually even see imprints of the feathers. And if we look at the Berlin specimen and other specimens, you can see that they're even better preserved than the London specimen. This is extremely unusual for fossils as old as Archaeopteryx, fossils from the Jurassic period. Normally when something fossilizes, only like part of its teeth will fossilize or a bit of its skull. But Archaeopteryx and a number of other specimens, we have entire skeletons for. And the special fossil beds that we find them in are what we call Lagerstatten. Lagerstatten is actually a German word. I don't speak German, so I'm actually pronouncing it wrong. If you want to say it right, you say it like this. Lagerstätten. And Lagerstatten are special fossil beds that preserved animals so well that you can actually usually even see not only their entire skeletons, but also bits and pieces of what their soft tissue may have looked like. So in the case of Archaeopteryx, we can see these beautiful feathers that it had on its body. Lagerstatten form in several different ways. One of the most common ways is through a local catastrophe, maybe like a crazy dust storm or a mudslide or a volcano. One of my favorite examples of a catastrophic Lagerstatten is the Ashfall fossil beds in Nebraska. Sadly, I have not been there. It's on my wish list. What happened here is a volcano erupted and it killed all of the animals in the local region by suffocating them in ash. Horrible way to go. And because they all died together, there were no scavengers to start eating the bodies and scattering the bones, which is what normally happens when something dies. And because the ash continued to fall after these animals died, they were buried. You know, normally if a skull were to just sit on the ground in the sun, it's going to slowly oxidize. Uh, when it gets wet in the rain, bacteria can grow inside of it and start to digest even the bone. The vast majority of animals that die never become fossils. But in these rare local catastrophes, everything was preserved. Another way that Lagerstatten form is when the environment somehow produces a natural trap. One of the really neat examples of this that I actually have been able to see for myself are the tar pits in Los Angeles. 
the La Brea Tar Pits. These are natural tar springs. There's tar just bubbling up out of the ground. Back in the day when large animals roamed in the area that is now known as Los Angeles, things like uh, mammoths, they would stumble into these tar pits and they would get stuck. And they'd start to freak out because they're stuck in a tar pit. And them freaking out would attract all kinds of predators. Giant dire wolves would try and get the mammoth that was stuck in the tar. Saber-toothed cats would come and try and eat the mammoths that were stuck in this tar. It, it was like these predators could not resist. And all of them would die in the tar together. It's just it's this horrible trap. a horrible joke that nature played on these animals at the time. And just as a quick little side note. If you look at any ecosystem, you will find that prey animals, animals that get eaten by predators, they always outnumber predators within a specific environment. And the reason for that is that predators have to eat multiple prey animals during their life. And so there has to be more prey than there are predators. If the predator population gets too big, certain predators start to starve to death. And so the population just naturally shrinks down again. But in the tar pits, because these mammoths would get stuck, they would attract predators from all around. So we actually have, in this one fossil bed, we have more predators than we have prey animals. There are just tons of dire wolves and tons of saber-toothed cats. This is a picture of my cousin Paige standing in front of a giant wall of dire wolf skulls. There's just so many, many dire wolf skulls that the museum didn't even know what to do with them. They just made a big, giant wall of them. Hi, Paige. I miss you. During the Jurassic period, in what we now call Germany, natural traps formed and were trapping all sorts of animals. It wasn't tar pits that were doing this. Instead, it was extremely salty lagoons, seawater that's been cut off from the ocean, or at least partially cut off. When you get a lagoon that's fully cut off from the ocean, it'll start to evaporate, and a lot of times the salinity, the salt content, will rise because there was a bunch of seawater, the water is evaporating out, but that salt and the calcium and other minerals stays in there. And it formed this nasty, toxic brine. Animals that would fall in there, maybe during a storm, uh, sea animals would get washed into the lagoon, and it was just so salty they would die. Pterosaurs would fall into the lagoon. Maybe they were going down for a little drink and start choking on the nasty, salty water and end up falling in and dying. And little bird-like reptiles, Archaeopteryx were also falling in and dying. And because the water was so salty, it would actually pickle their little bodies. <laughs> they would be preserved in brine. So here you have this giant natural trap that's just making pickled pterodactyls. And there's nothing that can enjoy eating these pickled pterodactyls because everything that goes in there, all the scavengers like crabs and whatnot that would go in there, they would die too. And they could not tear apart those bodies and scatter the bones. Furthermore, there's a lot of calcium in seawater, especially in warm, shallow seas. There's a lot of calcium dissolved into the water. And when the water evaporates, that calcium forms little crystals, little microscopic crystals. Because the water, as it starts to evaporate, it can no longer handle all of the calcium that used to be suspended in it. So that calcium falls out of suspension. It starts to crystallize with carbon. These microscopic calcium crystals would form, and they would just fall down kind of like snow in the water and bury those pickled animals at the bottom of the lagoon. And so we got this beautiful fossil preservation of all of these animals in there with extremely fine grains falling on top of them and allowing us to even see the outlines, in the case of Archaeopteryx, the outlines of his feathers. Lagerstaten. Remember that word. There's, there's hundreds of Lagerstaten throughout the world dotted across the globe, and they teach us a lot about life on Earth, much more so than the normal bits and pieces of fossils that we normally find. So that was the first interesting thing about Archaeopteryx, the first thing that just blew everybody's minds, the absolutely beautiful, pristine preservation of these incredible fossils. Second, Archaeopteryx is a perfect transitional fossil. Archaeopteryx had feathers, and because of that, in the 1800s, when Richard Owen first classified this animal. He classified it as a bird. But Archaeopteryx was unlike any other bird that anyone had ever seen before. It had teeth, reptilian teeth. You can see that in the skull. It had three fingers and three claws on its wings, and it had this long, bony tail. Now, if you're not very familiar with the anatomy of birds, you might think, what's the big deal? Lots of birds have long tails, like macaws, for example, have these huge long tails. What's the big deal about Archaeopteryx having a long tail? Well, 
A macaw does have a long tail, but that long tail is made out of feathers. The tails of all modern birds are extremely short, and they have on the end this little nebby bone that the tail feathers grow off of. Archaeopteryx was very different from this. It had a long bony tail, and feathers would come off of each vertebra on that tail, each tailbone. Archaeopteryx was discovered and described right as the theory of evolution was being discussed by scientists. The scientific community was debating the theory of evolution. And because of this, Archaeopteryx was very controversial. People at the time thought that Archaeopteryx was some sort of a dinosaur or lizard that someone had attached feathers to. So they thought that it was an actual reptile fossil. And then someone added mud to it and pressed feathers into that mud. They thought that this was done as a trick to convince people that evolution was was a real thing. And this was a very serious accusation because Archaeopteryx was described by Richard Owen, who was a very respected paleontologist at the time. And to think that he would pull this kind of trick, people were like, we need to look into this. This is crazy. The other weird thing about that is that Richard Owen was actually against the theory of evolution. He was arguing against it at the time. So to think that he would have perpetuated this fraud, it's kind of a weird thing to think. But people were so outraged by this fossil, they thought it must be a fraud. It was too perfect. It was a perfect confirmation of Darwin's theory just two years after the theory was published. What are the odds of that happening, right? So they looked into it. It was debated and investigated intensely. And finally, it, it was just too obvious. The fossil was, in fact, real. Not only that, but uh, 11 more specimens were eventually found in Germany in that same area. There is no longer any doubt. Archaeopteryx was a real bird-like dinosaur, and nobody could do anything to deny that. This fossil really helped us understand the origin of birds, that birds indeed evolved from reptiles. And it really helped the scientific community get behind the idea of evolution and start to accept it as a scientific concept. The third thing that Archaeopteryx did for us was it confirmed beyond all reasonable doubt that bird wings are modified arms and hands. Now, people who were studying anatomy at the time already pretty much knew this. If you look at a bird's wing, if you look at the bones, you've got one bone, two bones, wrist, hand, and finger bones inside the wing. If you look at any bird, it's got this huge breast bone, this huge, you know, it's similar to our, our chest bone, but it's got this big keel in the middle. And there's these giant pectoral muscles that pretty much take over the entire bird's body. I mean, a bird is mostly like pecs and feathers. <laughs> That's what a bird is. To most scientists, it was obvious that bird wings were modified arms already. But to people in the general public, wings don't look anything like arms. That's why so many artists will paint mythical beasts like Pegasus and kind of just glue wings on their backs. You know, in reality, this thing could not fly. Angels, the way that, that artists typically paint them, there's absolutely no way that those bodies would work. In order for a wing to flap, it needs these huge pectoral muscles. But Archaeopteryx made it very, very clear that wings are in fact modified reptilian arms. Now, just to add to this fact, if you look at chicken embryos as they develop, there was this really neat study done a few years back where they would interrupt an egg during development at certain stages. They'd take out the embryo and they'd dye it so that you could see the bones. Actually, it's the cartilage because bones start out as cartilage. And you can actually see the chicken wings forming. They started out as three-fingered arms, and those arms would get more and more wing-like until finally you get this structure that looks like a chicken wing. If you look at this as it's developing, the bones that are inside this chicken wing as it's developing, they correlate exactly to the bones that we find in the hand of Archaeopteryx. There is just absolutely no way to deny this any longer. Bird wings are modified arms. Today we learned a new word, Lagerstadt, or in the plural, Lagerstatten. Lagerstatten are fossil beds that preserve animals so well that we get their entire skeletons, and sometimes we even get the outlines of soft tissue. They can form through local catastrophes, or they can form through natural animal traps. We learned that Archaeopteryx was an extremely important fossil because it really helped confirm the theory of evolution back in the 1800s when the scientific community was debating it. I mean, people still do debate evolution today, but it's not the actual scientific community that's doing that. 
we have long since achieved what's called scientific consensus about evolution. And finally, Archaeopteryx confirmed once and for all that bird wings are, in fact, modified reptilian arms. If you enjoyed this video but you have not yet subscribed to my channel, make sure to do that right now by clicking the subscribe button and the little bell next to it. Clicking on that bell makes sure that you get a notification when I publish the next video in this series. In the next video, I will look at what Ken Ham has to say about Archaeopteryx. We're going to compare his display to what we actually know from the fossil record. So that'll be a fun video. Make sure to stay tuned and check that one out. So long for now. Stay curious.